Well, welcome to Butterfly Lodge. People often ask, why is this called Butterfly Lodge? I don't know if you're aware of the way trees are invasive around this area, but the ponderosas move in and take over open meadows. And this used to be a big, wide open meadow here. And there are all kinds of wildflowers here. And those wildflowers attracted the butterflies. And the original owner of this cabin, he had this cabin built as his hunting lodge, thought this place needed a name, so he called it Butterfly Lodge. In Blackfeet tongue, it was called Opunya Oyas. This cabin was built in 1913 as a hunting lodge for James Willard Schultz. And the story of James Willard Schultz and his half Blackfeet son, Lone Wolf, are centered in Greer, at least, on this cabin. James Willard Schultz was a young man from upstate New York, not too far north of Manhattan. He was born in Boonville, New York, in 1859. He was a rather adventurous lad. He would love to get out in the woods all the way up into the Adirondacks. He loved the hunting, the fishing that was available in those days. And his parents, actually his mother mainly, his father died when he was 14. But his parents decided early on that he was destined to become a army officer, a cadet at West Point. <coughs> because of that, they enrolled him at Peekskill Military Academy, which was not too far from Boonville. And he did well for the first several years there, actually until his junior year. His junior year, they were having the graduation ceremony for the class ahead of him, and he and a buddy of his decided that it would be good fun to shoot the cannon in the cannon green. In the process, destroying several windows and destroying his career as an army officer because the authorities suggested he not come back the next year. Well, this was early spring when graduations occurred. His mother thought it would be a good idea for him to have a little disciplining in business and management, and his uncle was the owner and manager of the Planters Hotel in St. Louis. So he went out to visit his uncle in St. Louis. This was when he was going on 18. He moved out there in 1877. And if you recall, I believe Custer's last stand was in 1876. So there probably was still a good deal of hostility going on in that area at that time. Anyway, James got out to St. Louis and was fascinated by the Indians that came into town, by the mountain men, the hunters, the trappers that all came into St. Louis down the Missouri and Mississippi River. He uh, was supposed to go back at the end of the summer, but he decided he'd stay on for a time. He wired back to his mother, asked for $500, and would promise to return after a year if she would send him the $500 and allow him to go up the Mississippi and the Missouri up to Fort Benton, the headwaters of navigable waters, rather, of the Missouri River at that time. That was about, because of the meanders of the two rivers, that was about a 2,000 mile, tri mile trip by river. Anyway, he gets up to Fort Benton, gets off the steamer, and one of the first people he met was Joe Kipp. And Joe was a half-breed trader to the Indians up there, had a trading post. And he took James under his wing very quickly. The two of them became partners in a trading post for a time. But shortly after he arrived in Fort Benton, through Joe's activities, he learned enough Blackfeet that he could converse reasonably well and made many friends with several other Blackfeet Braves. Friendly enough to go out on a raiding party once to get a bride for one of these new newfound friends that he had. Well, the time went on and the year was supposed to be up and he was not going to return to New York. He did visit a couple of times later on, but it was very short visits back with his mother. He basically stayed in the West after that for the rest of his life. As I said, he was going on 18 when he arrived there. Okay, stop right there. 
when, when, as I mentioned, when James Willard Shields came to Fort Benton, he was going on 18, 1877. After another two years going on 20, it was suggested by some of his friends that he really should have a fuller life and should have a woman. So he looked around, he saw this lovely young Indian maiden. She had a, an injured, an arm that was injured from an old injury, but she seemed to be a very nice lady and she was only 15 years old. And so they decided they'd live together as husband and wife. In those days, a lot of white guys would come by and have temporary marriages with uh, Indian maidens. And, and Nataki was the name of his new bride. And Nataki was always worried that he was going to go off and leave at any time. Well, one day a traveling preacher came through and they had a Christian ceremony, wedding ceremony, and she was greatly relieved. She thought maybe he was going to stick around for a few years, which he did. The two of them had two children. Uh, one child that we'll talk about later was named Lone Wolf. His Anglo name was Hart Miriam Schultz. And Miriam's name is attached to an elk and a turkey and he was a wildlife expert, a, a botanist and so on, a good friend of, of Schultz's eventually. Anyway, his Anglo name was supplanted for most of his life by his Indian name, which was Lone Wolf. His grandfather, his backfeet grandfather named him that. And we'll come back and talk about him a bit later on. Uh, Schultz and Nataki lived together for 20 plus years. She died in 1903 on a trip down the Missouri. Uh, and I'm not sure why she died, whether it was heart trouble or lung trouble or whatever. Uh, because of that potential for her having had tuberculosis, her son Lone Wolf migrated down south ending up in Arizona. And I'll tell more about that later also. Schultz lived as a rancher, as a trader, as a guide. He knew all of the areas for hunting and fishing up there. And the Indians at that time were becoming rather destitute because of the decimation of the buffalo tribes. The buffalo were being wiped out by white hunters and by the Indians themselves. And Schultz became very concerned about their welfare and got people from the east who were influential to come out acted as a guide for them for hunting parties, for fishing, so on, for exploration of the country around there, and had many influential people come from the east to see what was going on in Montana. One of the main persons that he got to know very well was a man named George Bird Grinnell. Grinnell was the owner and publisher of Forest and Stream magazine, I think also Boy's Life. He was one of the founders of the Audubon Society and had all kinds of connections in the East. He and uh, Schultz wandered the country up there. They thought it was magnificent country, too great to be open to development. And through their influence, particularly Grinnell's influence back East, they persuaded the, the uh, powers that be to form Glacier National Park. And if you go to Glacier, many of the places up there are named by Schultz and by Grinnell. There's a Grinnell Glacier, the only road through Glacier is going to the Sun Road, named after the Going to the Sun Mountain, named both by Schultz at that time. Schultz was given an Indian name. His Indian name was Apakuni. And there's a, a pale green limestone formation that runs through Glacier Park, and that's called the Apakuni Formation, named after Schultz. And if you go to Glacier, there are just all sorts of places you can look into that were named by those two people. Because those are just some of the examples. Schultz continued after Nataki died in 1903. And Schultz was pretty broken up by that. But he continued for a time after that, for a short time after that, guiding people from the east. And one of the people that he guided was Pulitzer, uh, the son of the founder of the Pulitzer Prize. And Pulitzer poached some sheep. And I imagine there were white sheep. I assume they were the doll sheep that he killed. He killed four sheep out of season, uh, shipped their heads back, had them mounted. And authorities back east saw the mounts, realized that it was an illegal taking of the sheep, 
got in charge, of, uh, got in touch with the game warden in Montana. I think there was only game one game warden in Montana at that time. They asked who his guide was. They learned it was James Schultz, James Willard Schultz. And the game warden came after Schultz and he fled Montana and moved to California. Grinnell had been listening to the tales that Schultz told him about Indian life and was encouraging him to write them down, which he did. And through Grinnell's ownership of the publications, they were serialized. And the story is that kids in the small towns throughout the West and the East, I guess also, uh, would gather when the postmaster was coming in with a new shipment of those magazines so they could be the first ones to continue reading the serial. Uh, through Gunnell's urging, Schultz, as he was in California, was beginning to write more and more. He wrote for the Los Angeles Times. And Grinnell persuaded him to start writing his stories, his short stories, into book form. So his first book was published in 1907, and it was basically biographical, entitled My Life as an Indian. A marvelous story. In the West, Schultz was compared with the Indian writer James Fenimore Cooper in the East, who wrote all the leather stocking series on the Indian life. We personally have a contact because we lived in Cooperstown, New York for a time, and so we got imbued with that part of Indian life as well as living here in the West with Indian life in the West. Uh, Schultz, after he had left Montana, had a varied uh, marriage career with about three wives thereafter. Grinnell got him out of the first one, which was an unfortunate one, and then he divorced his second wife and married a lady that really loved the Indians, unlike the third wife who didn't want to have anything to do with him. Uh, in those years, Schultz was sort of migrating back and forth between California, and because Lone Wolf had moved down to Arizona at that time, <coughs> Schultz started visiting him. The two of them lived together for a time. And Schultz lived in Arizona long enough to go on many of the uh, archaeological digs. He helped at the Casa Grande ruins, helped at some of the other ruins here. And so he sort of spent the rest of his time back and forth between California, Arizona, and Montana. And then I'll go back now to uh, his son, the story about Lone Wolf, his son. Lone Wolf, uh, as I said, moved to Arizona, worried about his lungs. He ended up in the Grand Canyon. As a child, his grandfather had noted he loved to draw on, on skins as they were drawing them and encouraged him in his artistic endeavors. When he came to the Grand Canyon, he ran into Thomas Moran, the well-known painter, and Moran recognized his talent as well and suggested that he go to art school. He went to art school in Los Angeles for a time. Later on, he went to an art school in Chicago and, and honed his talents artistically. And eventually he became a, known as the first Native American painter. Native American artist. In addition to his painting, he also liked to work with clay, and he would model little animals out of the local clay in the river uh, banks, and then had fun doing that as well. And eventually got into making several bronzes, not, not a whole lot. He actually ended up painting some 500 paintings, and I think he only did maybe a dozen or 15 or so bronzes. Uh, a side note, one of those bronzes is in the Phoenix Art Museum. The last time I was there, which was some years ago, it was prominently displayed. It was your, the first bronze you saw. And it's a bronze of an Indian brave on a horse shooting his bow or shooting his arrow off his bow into a bison running beside him. Uh, we were fortunate when we opened this lodge on the opening to have the Phoenix Art Museum lend us that bronze, and it was prominently displayed, displayed right here. The uh, Subsequent course of Lodwell's wife was mainly centered in Arizona. He, uh, as I said, went to art school. He started selling his paintings to the Santa Fe Railroad up in, as they were coming through the Grand Canyon area, and was paid, I think, initially about $100, which was a lot of money in those days for a painting. He uh, had his paintings bought by Theodore Roosevelt, by Calvin Coolidge, by Herbert Hoover, other notable people that had, had uh, interest in what he was doing. 
he uh, continued his artwork and he and James Willard Schultz, his father, lived here in their hunting lodge together for some time. I'll skip back now to why this lodge is here. It was built for James Willard Schultz by some of the local people. Uh, I think uh, the Butlers and the Crosbys were the ones that constructed it for him in 1913. The lodge Going ahead to the history of the lodge, the lodge was on forest service land and after Lone Wolf and Schultz left the lodge, it became a storage facility for the forest service and was to be torn down about uh, 1990, I guess it was. And it was then salvaged from the forest service by a Phoenix lady whose husband, Sam Applewhite, was a lawyer in Phoenix and Karen thought it was too valuable a resource to be torn down and so she managed to get it on the National Register of Historic Sites and preserved it that way and it was opened as a museum in 1995. <clears throat> uh, going back to uh, Schultz and, and Lone Wolf, Schultz had it built as a hunting lodge for turkeys. Greer had been known to have a lot of turkeys around it in Montana, I'm told, I'm not sure that's true, but I'm told there were no turkeys. So it's hunted for everything else up there. But I wanted to have the experience of hunting turkeys. So he had this lodge built for that particular purpose. And between Lone Wolf and Schultz, they were able to, to tame a coyote as their hunting dog. <laughs> and use that dog to hunt turkeys. Unfortunately, Schultz and, and Lone Wolf were away one time for about three weeks and he turned the coyote over to a friend of his to take care of And he was taking care of him fine, but somebody saw a coyote and bam, shot him because you don't want to have coyotes around. So that was the end of their hunting dog. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, time about 1916, I think, was when Lone Wolf basically took over this as his more or less permanent residence. About that time he met a lady from, a Mormon lady from St. John's, Naoma Tracy. They got married and this became their honeymoon cottage. The wedding present that uh, Lone Wolf gave to Naoma was that painting that we see over there of the Grand Canyon that he had done. And as far as I'm concerned, that's the very best painting that, that Lone Wolf ever did which would be appropriate as a honeymoon present. Mm -hmm. The painting has a, a good history of being here, disappearing, showing up at an art auction. A local uh, supporter of the museum saw the painting and was on a bidding contest with, it was done by, by uh, internet, was uh, on a contest bidding for it. An art dealer outbid it, uh, obtained the painting, uh, eventually the people that were bidding for it went to the art dealer and bought it back from him so that it could be in its original location. And those were uh, Charlie and Mary Bast were the, the uh, patrons that did that. In addition to the painting, you can see the bison on the fireplace over there. The original bison were in clay and Lone Wolf did them for Naoma, his bride. Over the years, the, the clay disintegrated, and a, a local sculptor here, James Muir, reconstructed them in bronze now so that they could be put back in the location of the original bison. There are photographs. There's one on the wall over there, and then when you go into the Arizona, Lowell well, made many friends, and one of the friends he had was Jack Tinney in Tucson. Jack Tinney was a, a good friend of Tom Mix as well. As a matter of fact, when Tom Mix was killed going up the Florence Highway, he had just left Tinney's home at that time. But because of his connection with Jack Tinney, who was the founder of the Tucson Rodeo Parade, Lone Wolf was for many years the Grand Marshal of the Tucson Rodeo Parade. We moved permanently to Tucson in 1964 Lone Wolf died at St. Mary's Hospital in Tucson in 1970. But during those years, we would take, those, when our kids were little, we would take our kids to the rodeo parade and 
the first person you saw on the rodeo parade on his white horse with all of his Indian headdress was Lone Wolf. And so we may have well have, have seen him as we were early in our permanent life in Tucson. No way, I'd like to find out if he actually ever was the one that we saw there. Uh, as mentioned, he died in 1970. Both he and Schultz were cremated and their ashes are now buried up on the Blackfeet Reservation near Browning, Montana. The displays in here are numerous. Many of them, most of them, are artifacts that uh, Karen and Sam gathered, gathered over the years through relatives of the Naomas in St. John's. One of her relatives had a whole raft of collection of things that she had had, and many of them she donated happily to the, the museum here. I think my favorite display is the hanging display rack in the uh, studio room, which has many clippings of the history of Lone Wolf's art exhibits when he would go to one-man shows in New York and in Chicago, uh, in the West Coast, and you could spend a day or two looking at all of those clippings in there. There are also uh, photographs of many of his paintings that are not available here, but many of his original paintings are available in his studio. The cabin was, as I said, originally for the two of them as a hunting lodge. Lone Wolf added on his, his studio back there, and after he and Naomi were married, they added on the bathroom and the kitchen as well. Uh, in the uh, bedroom, you'll see things that Naomi had done. She was a bead maker and did a lot of beading work. Uh, she was a little gal, and there's a very tiny black gown that she wore, I think, on the New York trip, as well as the mink coat that she bought for that trip in there. Uh, she's got little tiny shoes in there that are cute to watch. And some of the letters that Lone Wolf wrote to people who were asking about his artwork are in there as well. Uh, James Willard Schultz's original typewriter is behind, behind me there where he wrote his books. And he ended up writing on that typewriter some 37 novels altogether. And on the shelf back there, I think we have all 37 of them. <clears throat> one of his books that he wrote, the only, I think he wrote two or three about Arizona, but the first one he wrote was called In the Great Apache Forest. And it was the story of George and Hannah Crosby. They were up as fire lookouts on Mount Baldy and the story of their encounter with a grizzly bear up there. Kind of a fun book for people from Greer. Mm -hmm. The uh, other book that I recommend to people is On the Road to Nowhere, which is Karen Applewhite's book, The Story of Greer, from 1879 to 1979. And Karen is a good artist in her own right with pencil sketches of Greer sites, and also she did pencil sketches of historical buildings all around the whole area here of Greer, Springerville, Eager, Alpine, and so on. People come in here and they can spend a long time or as little time as they wish looking at the various artifacts that are here, but it's really a wealth of material that it's hard to exhaust basically until you've spent months here looking at them all, really. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Okay. This is a new addition too, isn't it? Yes. It's a newer cover. There's four different covers for this okay. book. Yeah, right. You're this right. is the newest one. Okay. This was uh, James Willard Schultz's first book, My Life as an Indian. It's a biographical sketch of his years as an Indian. It was published in 1907. Many years ago, my wife Ginny and I were up in Montana and we started haunting old bookstores, and we did find a first edition of it, which we're very pleased to have in our, our library connection. And then, as I mentioned, he did three books on Arizona. This was his first one in the Great Apache Forest, the story of two young kids, George and Hannah Crosby, doing a fire lookout time up on Mount Baldy and their encounter with a bear up there, a grizzly bear. And then finally, the other book I recommend to people is by Karen Applewhite. And it's a story of Greer 
from 1879 to 1979, The Road to Nowhere, and illustrated by Karen with her own pencil sketches in it. And uh, Karen came first to Greer as an infant, and she lived in a cabin that was built here called Little Nantucket. And it was called Little Nantucket because Karen's family is descended from the Coffins, and the Coffins were an old famous whaling family from Nantucket originally. So more Eastern history tying back in with the Western history. <laughs>